Well, thank you very much and thank you all for coming. Um, the last time I was here was with an Aboriginal writer called Anita Heiss and uh, she was under sustained attack from Andrew Bolt and he'd attacked her that morning and um, she'd been deluged with, uh, bombed with hate mail and her book on Amazon had been bombed and the, uh, the dysfunction was nearly called off and uh, they ended up bringing us in, by, bringing us in, in a car down to some uh, parking place, a couple of floors down there up in a lift, and um, they had a big German. He was six foot five, 196 centimetres, about the size of Will Minson, mate, and he sat over there. <laughs> and the idea was that if anyone rushed the stage, he, Klaus, his name was Klaus, he was going to get him. And, and that's the first thing I've noticed tonight, Bobby, he's not there. Out. <laughs> Klaus is out. So, <laughs> Klaus is out, mate. So if any enraged Collingwood supporter rushes the stage, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, mate, Murphy. That'd be an Irish name, wouldn't it? Mm. Uh, your mother's name? Uh, Slattery. That'd be Irish also. <laughs> That'd be Irish. <laughs> so tell me, does being, do you have a connection to Ireland? Do you feel you've got a connection to Ireland? Um, is it part of you? It is a part of me, but I've got to say that in our house growing up, it was, and mum and dad are here somewhere, um, to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, He's very good, I'm telling you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in our house, there was, I mean, there was a few Furies records and uh, maybe the odd uh, pint of Guinness, but we weren't a real Irishy um, family until, until... And I didn't feel a, a great connection with it until um, I was lucky and I got picked in, the, in that International Rules um, series where we flew over to Ireland to, to, to play the Irish and... This might be a good time, Martin, to ask whether we're allowed to swear tonight because this story... Um, but, and so I'd never felt particularly Irish, but we were playing in a warm-up. Before we played the Irish, we were going to play Derby, Derby County in the back blocks of this old soccer pitch and we we're going to have a little warm-up game. And Anyway, the bus pulled up with you know, Steve Silvani and Craig Bradley and all these superstars. And, the, and we just, the bus just stopped and all of a sudden there was this whack, whack, whack. And we all sort of ducked and turned around and there was about six of these little kids, they would have been aged between four and seven, throwing rocks at the bus <laughs> and every one of them could have been me. And I just sort of... I wasn't... And then I thought, Jesus, I am Irish. <laughs> and then as we played the game, we are standing out on the field and, um, <laughs> and this, this young lad from, from Dublin County, we were playing the balls up the other end and he just sort of glanced at me and then he looked behind and we, he saw the name on my back of my shirt and he's like, Murphy, you fucking traitor. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, and that was sort of, and then the crowd got into it and you fucking traitor. <laughs> so after that I was kind of like, yeah, right, I'm home. So, yeah, yeah. Now, um, can I ask you, can yeah, I yeah. ask you a question? Yeah. Because um, in this fantastic book, it might be the funniest book I've ever read, the short, long <laughs> book. Um, Michael Long refers to you as the great white hunter. Um, but I want to know what kind of a footballer you were. <laughs> well, that's a very hard question to ask a 60-year-old man, mate, but um, what sort of a footballer was I? Uh, I was timid but fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> My brother and I always agreed that if you wanted to watch footy, really the only place to watch it was out there. Um, so you had to play it to see that it's best. But I grew up in, in, a, in a culture which was very introverted. People hardly spoke. And, um, and then at about 11 or 12, I got out in the footy field and found this place where people psychologically unzipped themselves and let it all out. And um, that was the first thing I loved about it, was just as, um, as theatre that it was so so revealing of people. Uh, but you were talking about going to Ireland, mate. The Flanagans are all from a place called Elfin in Roscommon. And um, I went back there about 10 years ago, five years ago. I'm no good with time. First night in the pub, I met a guy called Martin Flanagan. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I went to watch the Elfin team play football. And um, their best player was this guy coming out of defence, would have been good at our game, called Colin Rock. And afterwards I went over and I made a big fella of myself, I gave him one of my books. Um, and he looked at it and he said, how do I know you are this Martin Flanagan? And uh, I said, well, well, you don't really. <laughs> anyway, mate, why did you... Um, your, writing, your writing coincides with your 
with the start of your AFL career? Mm. What, how, did that, how did those two things happen at once? So say that again. The... Your writing. Yep. Your writing. You started, you started writing, as I understand it, around the time that you started playing in the AFL. Yep. Why, was, why do those two things link up? Uh, it, was a, it was a bit after. I'd played, I'd played a few years um, and I'd, I'd hurt my knee the year before and the, uh, the, a guy at the footy club, actually, Matthew Drain, came up and said to me, um, he said, oh, there's an opportunity to write, to write for the age. Do you want to do it? And I naively sort of said, yeah. So with, with as much thought about it as that, you know, in my footy boots, I went, oh, yeah. You know, we used to read the age at, in, at home and... <laughs> I thought, oh, I'll give it a go, and, and I, I, I rang my manager to say, oh, I'm going to write for the A's, and he said, yeah, we've had 10 players turn it down. I said, okay, so I was the 11th to, I was the 11th to, um, to, to take it up, but um, what I didn't know then, which is what I, I sort of look back on it now, is that I was, I was pretty restless at the time in my footy career, um, and I felt, I guess the way I describe it is probably unbalanced that... Yeah, the the public self, you kind of ride the wave of whether you get a kick, whether your team wins, where you are on the ladder. All your self-esteem was just with with the fortunes of the bounce of the ball, which, as everyone knows in sport, let alone footy, it's it's a pretty um, you know it can go either way. So when I started writing, I thought about, geez, what what am I going to write about, and what what kind of a writer do I want to be? And at the time, I was frustrated with how um, how much negativity there was in the game and towards players, I thought, well, I'll just I'll write about the things that I love. I'll, that's, that seems to be a, a decent place to start. Um, and that was always what I sort of went back to, is I just want to I want to write about the things that I love. And, and in a weird way, I think it forced me just to think about, other than the obvious things, winning, um, you know, the, the, I mean, that's what sort of players go back to. What do you enjoy most about the game? Either 10 minutes after a win. And, and whilst that is... The best bit. I was sort of like, well, yeah, but what else is there? So I got into, you know, the singing the song and the smell of a footy, and and so that that eventually gave me balance, and it and in a weird way, it, I think it made me a, a better footballer and definitely a more a, a more content person for sure. What what is it that you think the public least understands about being an AFL footballer, or how an AFL footballer sees it? Um, I think. It's probably there's two there's a couple of things, but I think the level of scrutiny on players now. When I started 15 years ago, I had a hard time adjusting to it, and it's probably gone up 200% since then. Um, I think what what gets forgotten often is um, players uh, under all this scrutiny. We, you know, we get the shiny new uniform, you get the new haircut, and they get out on the field, and we all kind of look the same. And every you know, in these elite football clubs. But we've all come from Warrigal Footy Club, you know, Ararat Footy Club. We've we've sort of come from from country footy clubs, and the and the scrutiny on players in the media has gone up exponentially. But also, but inside footy clubs, it's um, you know they get their pound of flesh of you know the the scrutiny on performance. We now film training. Um, every, everything you do is reviewed, analysed, critiqued, and that's balanced off with positives and. And, and some really good stuff. But there's no doubt that that, that weighs heavily on, on a lot of players. And, and now with the int- you know, with social media playing such a big part of... I think I worry, I worry for, the, for guys perhaps who haven't got the balance that, that some are lucky to have, that it's, it's a burden that can take away from, from enjoying the game. How, how many AFL players do you think actually do enjoy playing it? Because one of your lines that I loved, um, which you would have written maybe three or four years ago, was that most players are fans of the game. Mm. Um, are they still? I think they are, and I think, I think they do love the game, and we're talking in general terms, of course, but I think some of them are overawed, I guess, or it's, th- there's so much, so much pressure on them, so much scrutiny in the public nature of it that their joy for the game or their enjoyment is kind of not as obvious to them as, as when they were playing at Warrigal, Warrigal or Ararat or where they were from, where, where the game was just in the moment. Yeah. 
the, the enjoyment of footy was the ball bounces that way and you read it better than him and you scoop it up and give it to your teammate down the field, that yeah. sense of exhilaration, that's still there for players, but I think there's just there's now so many other dimensions to the footy that they just don't find enjoyable, which I can, I can completely sympathise with. And I look at the best players, um, I look at Cyril, I look at... I look at Dane Swan, I look at the, the, the guys and you, you know, from your own teams and you think about the very best players, they play it with a childlike enthusiasm. They do. They all and it's ironically enough, all the work we do at, you know, footy clubs with leadership groups and sports psych, all that all that field, the mental side of footy, is about playing in the moment. They, they were good at that when they were 10 and now we've <laughs> got to relearn it all because of all the other sort of things on it. And I chatted to um, Nat Fife in the pre-season. We had a, um, a captain's day where we all get together and, and I was chatting to him and he's a very knockabout, laconic sort of guy. He just happens to be the best player in the galaxy. <laughs> but he, he was saying, he's like, yeah, you know what? These blokes just get too bloody stressed, don't they? They... You know, because you, you'll find out where to stand when the game stops. But once the game starts again, you just rip into it. <laughs> and it was... That is it. And, and I think the biggest change in footy in my time is this two-sided of the brain thing. And I, I, don't, I hope it's not a, a boring thing to say, but when I started, it, it really was the forwards up there, the backs there, the midfielders, and throw up the ball, and the best players usually get it and you sort it out amongst yourselves. Um, and that... That's 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 how it should be, but now it's this thing of battleships of when the game stops, it really is about there's specific places to stand, and guys get so consumed by that about worry about where they've got to stand that when the game actually starts, they they worry they're in another place. Right. So is the it, players like Nat Fife, they they've got to get the balance of you just got to know where to stand and then play like you're ten years old again. Have you ever seen a talented player come into the game that ultimately didn't make it because they couldn't learn? Because they couldn't learn all this modern theory of yeah. that? I, I wouldn't want to mention his name, but I played with a guy whose talent was good enough to play 200... I mean, he, played, he would have played close to 100 games and um, he was a, a good player. But as soon as this... this uh, the technical side of... The, I call it the battleships of footy because it really is the plotted... Um, which people, you know, supporters hate hearing about it and players aren't doing backflips about it either, but he actually couldn't get his head around when the game stopped, when there's a ball up, which which side to stand. Yeah. And it cost him a spot in the team and then eventually he goes out and he's not playing anymore. It yeah. just seems... It's a shame in one sense, but, um, yeah, that that's just the reality that guys have to have that two-sided... Given how much footage changed in your time, what, 13 years? 16. 16. Where do you reckon it'll be in another 16? Oh. <laughs> um, I think it'll probably look a lot like the NFL looks now. That seems to be the... Um, and I'm not knocking the NFL, but I think that seems to be the, the accepted view that they've gotten it right and that's what we should kind of aspire to. And oh. um, I know you... <laughs> I know you're troubled by the flashing lights and the music. I yeah. think you'll be getting T-shirts shot out of a cannon <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty soon. Yeah, um, yeah so it's... Uh, I guess that's the doomsday sort of scenario, but I think we, we do so much well that I think it'll... Uh, I'm hoping that it, it looks pretty close to what we've got now. Yeah. yeah. Do opposition players ever read your columns? Um, or do you know that they do? Uh, I know a couple did. I, I'm pretty sure my own teammates never read it, but that's okay. Um, they never mentioned it. Uh, Harry Taylor once, he shook my hand and said, um, I, I, I read your column, which kind of shocked me. Um, but he's, was, he's a pretty interesting fellow. Yeah, he's an he? interesting guy. Yeah. He's an interesting guy. He's, very, he's kind of one out of the box, Harry. Yeah. But I had a, last year I wrote a column um, of my favourite footballers who play the game and and I got to the position of centre-half forward. We were playing St Kilda that week. And, um, and I thought, oh, I've, I've got, Lenny Hayes has to be in the team because he's Lenny Hayes and he's everyone's favourite. And, and I got to centre-half forward and I thought, well, 
I probably would want Nick Rewalt in the team, but we play him this week. I can't have that. I can't have... <laughs> I can't have him thinking that, you know, he's a, a bit of a hero to me. So I, I left him out and I put Matthew Pavlich in. And we're halfway through the second quarter and St Kilda got the ball. Nick Rewalt sort of sidles up to me and goes, and you, I'm fucking right off you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it, he said it with such passion. And I said, what are you, what are you talking to me? He goes, how didn't I make that team? And I was just like, oh, I said, oh, you know... I said, oh, you know, you, you were close. And as he, he turned to run away and he's just jogging away and he looks back and he's like, Jack fucking Gunston. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you one? Yeah. I want to ask you about, I don't know, I don't want to moz the, the new book because I love, I love the book and I'm sure everyone else will and I'm sure it'll get some magnificent reviews. <laughs> but I want to know. What's the worst review you've ever got? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a very interesting subject because um, I've written 16 books, so I've had a lot of, lot of reviews. Um, but I think the most spectacularly bad one I got was in 1993 when my first novel, Going Away, came out and it was just um, it was an account of my years wandering the world in my 20s and it was reviewed for the Sydney Morning Herald. I won't mention the woman's name because I'm sure even she would be embarrassed by what she wrote now. Um, but it started, she wrote at the start, um, early on she wrote, Flanagan writes like a drunk. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's reasonable. There's, <laughs> there's, there's a degree of perception in that. Uh, she said, Flanagan writes like a drunk. The reader prays for him to sober up for a single page, but he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> then she wrote, Flanagan wants to sexually conquer the universe. <laughs> And the universe is a very big place, really. <laughs> I thought that was, that was a big call. And then she wrote, um, this book is a finger in search of a warm, earthy, moist vagina. <laughs> and, um, and I thought that was crossing the line because there was no uh, description of an act of that nature in the book. So if ever I met her, I would have said, um, that's coming from you, your life, not from mine. But... Um, but I actually didn't mind that review because she hated the book, but she seriously engaged with it. Like, it really... There was, she was, certainly wasn't indifferent to it. Mm. Um, but <laughs> but I, um, I think uh, in writing... It's, writing has changed so much. Books has changed so much. Um, journalism, newspapers have changed so much in the time I've been doing it. But um, I th particularly in the old days, it was a bit of a spectator sport. It was a bit like the duck hunting season when you had a book out. And... And it's one of the things I feel for my brother about, uh, my brother Richard, because he really, he really cops it, because the higher you go, the more, of a, the more of a scalp you are. But eventually, certainly then, someone would get you. So there would be one review that would really get you, that would trigger some deep insecurity or fear you had about your work. And, um, and that eventually happened to me. Um, and, and they make you sick in the spirit. Um, but I remember telling this Aboriginal bloke, a friend of mine from um, up at Shepparton, and I told him about it. He said, come up here, brother. We'll smoke you. We'll protect you from that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, um, and, and, and after that, they never did hurt me again. Um, but I think getting really badly hurt and getting over it, it's a bit like initiation. You've got to go through it. Um, and it's all about learning who it is you answer to. Once you know who you answer to, once you know who, who are the the people whose opinions are the ones that matter, um, then, then it's fine. Yeah. Mm. I, it doesn't really... Opinions of my work don't really bother me anymore mm. much. <laughs> um, is there a moment when you were proud to be an Australian recently? Um, I reckon I've got... I, I could write a book about that, moments when I've been proud to be Australian, but if I just said one off the top of my head, um, I'd probably go... Um, with the time I spent with Dipper, with the, um, with the half Israeli, half Palestinian peace team, the AFL peace team. Um, they were a great story, uh, a phenomenal story. They're up and going again. One of the Israelis is now living with a Palestinian woman and he's got it going again. It's unkillable. Um, but Dipper was a magnificent with them. And, um, and I remember that the first time they toured, they, they played their last game in Warrnambool and they were... They were hopeless, but they were, 
<laughs> they had, they did have this spirit, and um, and uh, and and I'm not sure that you know I'm not sure that English is actually Dipper's first language. I'm not sure that Italian's <laughs> Italian's not his first language. So, so. Um, but he understands being an outsider and he understands about sport taking you to the inside. And uh, he really got into it. And so this last game they're playing down at Warrnambool. The team's around him at, three qu- at, at, at half time it was. And he's leaning over in, in the manner of the Australian footy coach. He goes, I fucking love you blokes. I fucking love yous. And he's got tears coming down his face. <laughs> and these, these Palestinians and Israelis are, are looking at him <laughs> like this. And, and gradually they're actually buying into this idea that they're actually a team. And, um, and then after that game, they're sitting in the rooms. This was their last game of their first tour. And uh, Dipper speaks to them for the last time. He says, we've got to keep in touch. He says, when you play footy with someone, you might not see him for years, then you see him walking down in the street and you say, fuck, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> And I reckon that's, that's one of the great Australian speeches. Uh, uh, I was with Dipper in a, in a, in a cafe in Jerusalem and he called for Hamas when he meant hummus. <laughs> uh, but they, they, were, they were phenomenal, the peace team. And some of the stories, like you could make a movie like one of the Palestinians wanted to get married and he didn't have the money and I think some of the Israeli guys chucked in and helped him find the money and he eventually got married and, um, and he invited them to the wedding and it was at the time that the, the Israeli soldier was kidnapped and all the Israelis were in the army so, and they were all under very strict rules about where they could go and couldn't go and eight of them got, eight of them got, got into the, this, this village, into this Palestinian village and they had to, you know, they had to go by bus, they had to go clandestinely and they got there and they, they sent out on Facebook the photos of them in their peace team jumpers dancing together and it was just fantastic, yeah, mm. just wonderful. Powerful thing. Yeah. Um, from what I could gather of the book Flanners, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the easiest, no. it wasn't the easiest um, book to write but what's the, what's the biggest thing, what's the biggest thing you learnt from the, from the book? Well, the, the, the really... F- the, the really strange thing about it, um, I mean, I, I could answer that by saying, you know, we, Michael Long and I drove from Melbourne to Darwin and it is a truly awesome thing to, um, to cross this continent with someone who's known every time he gets out of a car. I mean, that's by, by white people, by black people, by traditional Aboriginal people. That was, that was amazing. And that, the, the journey with him through Central Australia is really the highlight of the book. And, going back to the place where his father was stolen from. But if, if you asked me um, what, what it is I learned out of doing that book, it's, it's, it sounds, it sounds um, trite or, or obvious, but I, I learned that he was an Aboriginal man. I mean, a lot of people would say, well, we already knew that. But if, if to know an Aboriginal man, you've got to know him through his Aboriginality. And so, therefore, you've got to get into the story of his parents and how they were both stolen from traditional Aboriginal women how they were taken to the Tiwi Islands and the enormous, the enormous and dramatic impact that had on their family, on, on his parents and then because of that on, on his children and on his life. And so, yeah, the thing about Michael Long, I mean, he, he, um, he's not an honorary white fella. He's a, he is a, an Aboriginal man and that's his Aboriginal and his interests. In, in every way, he's an Aboriginal man and... Um, and and doing the book with him, like, it was almost impossible to work with, but I sort of loved it because he was just utterly authentic. And, and, they're, and they're, you know, he, they're, for most of the book, he just didn't take being in a book seriously because what, what's a sports book going to do for the problems of Aboriginal Australia? But, um, but in the end, I think he did see the point of it and, and that's probably the, the real joy for me in doing it, is that in the end he did, he did see the use of it. Mm. Yeah. Can you, can you quickly tell us, I just want you to tell me again, because I enjoyed it so much when I heard the first time, about the magpie geese and why, why he does call you the great white hunter. <laughs> well, it really tickled me. Well, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty long story, but Michael Long's father, Jack Long, he's, he's a legend. He's not just a legend because he was the toughest footballer in Darwin in his day, and believe you me, he was. 
and the stories about that are endless. But he's also this Crocodile Dundee character. He's this, he's this very famous hunter. And I remember Santa Longy once, um, you know, do you ever know anyone who fought off a crocodile? And he goes, yeah, Dad did. Um, you know, the, it, the stories about Jack Long are endless. So Michael Long was brought up by a great hunter and his family, they're very proud hunters. And um, he says he gets his skill from hunt, he, he got his footy skills from hunting. And if you go out and watch how the Tui Islanders play footy, you can see what he's on about. Um, so anyway, I've gone to Darwin with him and, um, and we've got to Darwin and he said, you know, he's going shooting magpie goose the next morning, do I want to come? And of course I want to come. And then he says, will you have a shot? And I go, oh, no, 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 thanks, Michael, I'll, I'll just have a... Oh, no, I'll just come for a look. So anyway, uh, we get up the next morning before dawn to head out uh, with a few of his mates. And as we're driving, he says, you're going to have a shot, Martin? And I go, no, oh, no, nah, nah, Michael, no, nah, no, nah, I'll just come and have a look, thanks, mate. <laughs> so we get out there and um, it's before dawn and the first lot of magpie geese come over and he has about five shots and he doesn't get any. And then the next lot of magpie geese come over and he gives me the gun. And I'm a big believer in when in Rome, do as the Romans do, went out in the bush with Aboriginal people, do what the Aboriginal people do. So I thought, all right. So I took the gun. I hadn't fired one since the school cadets 40-something <laughs> years earlier. And I thought, well, the best, the, the best chance for the goose is if I actually aim at it, because then I'm sure not to hit it. <laughs> so I, I went banging to my horror. <laughs> this... This thing plummeted out of the sky and bounced about 10 metres away. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm in horror thinking, oh, you know, what have I done? He's in awe. <laughs> he, he, and after five years, we finally had a story he wanted to talk about, but it wasn't about him, it was about me. <laughs> and um, so for the next few years, every time we, we were together, or every time he introduced me to anyone or if he were here tonight... He would have to tell the story, and every time it grew in the telling, and it was uh, it became this magnificent story. But so that's what he calls me: is the Great White Hunter, or, or for short, the Great White. <laughs> <laughs> now, mate, there was another question I have for you. Um, yes, your columns. What's what's the most interesting, or the strangest, or the weirdest, or the oddest, most memorable reaction you've ever had? Uh, the most memorable. <clears throat> I was in. Um I was waiting to watch a movie at, in Carlton at Nova. Yeah. And I was flicking through uh, at the magazine stand and, and this w I didn't know she was behind me. This woman came up right behind me and just whispered in my ear, you're not as interesting as you think you are. <laughs> and, <laughs> which, I don't have to tell you, Martin, was quite unsettling. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And when I when I put the book of columns together and and I and we Should launched, have dedicated yeah, to well, it. we lo I you know what I thought about that afterwards. I was so annoyed with myself that I didn't. But I I got up there and and I I thanked the woman who whose name I don't know, but I thanked her and I said, you know, I showed you, and then had the second thing. Well, I don't know. Did I show you or did you show me? I don't know. You know, yeah. pretty self indulgent to write a book of columns. But anyway. I got, um, I got hate mail from yeah. Blake for 25 years <laughs> and um, I always wanted, I wished I could have interviewed him. I reckon it'd be, it would have been a great story. <laughs> yeah, sort of, uh, he used to leave abusive messages on my phone. My wife could take him off perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, mate, over the, over the years, um, a lot of our most interesting conversations, for me, have been about fear. Mm. Um, and um, you are in the process of writing a book, which I'm looking forward to greatly because... It is a very special category of sports writing that is written by... It's one thing to be a sports writer who writes from observing from the other side of the fence, but there's a great tradition of sports writing from people who have actually done it. Uh, Peter Roebuck and Brent Croswell and people like that. And you're in the process of writing a book and you've written a passage on fear. Mm. And I was wondering if, if you would read that and then after Rob's read this, we'll ask for questions from the floor. Be happy to. Still in the draft phase, so just be kind. Um, and this is self-indulgent. And I'm not, not as interesting as I think I am, but here we go. Um, I'm sorry, Robbie, you've done it. It's gone. Those were the words from the Bulldogs' doctor, Gary Zimmerman, as I lay somewhat dazed on the moist turf of the Melbourne cricket ground. Moments earlier, in the blur of play, the ball had been shunted along the ground in my direction 
and as I took possession of the ball, I was wrapped up in a heavy tackle by Collingwood powerhouse Anthony Rocker. Or as mum likes to call him, bloody rocker. <laughs> Keep your feet was a mantra that had served me fairly well up until this point, but as I stubbornly tried to keep my feet in the ground and my legs rigid, the laws of physics and the jungle conspired against my knee joint. As Rocker picked me up, twisted me and slammed me into the ground, my feet remained in the ground and my left knee was ripped apart. When the medial and anterior ligaments in my knee ruptured, the sound I heard in my head was like the violent tear of Velcro, the sideways jolt a bit like ripping out the leg of a roast chook. Pain poured into the back of my knee, but it wasn't as sharp as, say, a broken bone, more like a throbbing ache. Then nothing. No pain, no sound. I knew enough about wrecked knees that if the pain disappears, then you're in big trouble. As Zimmer performed what is known as the test, I already knew my fate. I looked past the faces of the Footscray doctors, trainers and physios who looked down at me with an ocean of worry in their eyes, and all I saw was a clear black sky. I was in shock, no doubt, but I had this other growing panic inside me. Did I just dog it? I was struggling to remember the moments before I was tackled, and I was filled with dread that I'd flinched at the critical moment. To do my knee was one thing, but to do it with the added shame of pulling out or dogging it would have absolutely crushed me. As Hawthorne's Brad Sewell once wrote, a footballer's greatest fear is to show fear itself. If I had just dogged it, what would people be saying about me? What would be written? Would my teammates be ashamed of me? As the stretcher slowly rolled away from the field of play, I kept my gaze to the blankness of the sky and tried to keep the heaving panic at bay. Right on cue, a young Magpie supporter who looked about nine years old leant over the fence and yelled in my face, Murphy, you fucked my dream team. <laughs> <laughs> Despite his youth, it still felt a touch harsh at the time. <laughs> Once I'd been taken down into the rooms, our club surgeon, Dr David Young, walked me through the first phase of my rehabilitation, but I was only barely present in the room. I was uncomfortably numb. I only began to feel upset when a small group of players and coaches came into the room. I remember looking up to see one of those players, Luke Darcy, leaning against the wall. He looked devastated. Luke and I were very close. He'd driven me to training in my first weeks at the club, and I looked up to him as much as anyone. In that year, 2006, the Bulldogs were on the rise and I felt like I was on the rise too. I saw in Luke's eyes the fear and doubt that would torment me for the next few years. It might have been the moment when the shock subsided and a darker reality first began to settle. I sat in the dugout for the second half, but I don't remember much about the rest of the game. Collingwood ended up winning that night despite a gallant effort from the Dogs. My teammate and best mate, Daniel G in Syracuse, drove me home. It was a short and quiet trip. As we snaked up past Fitzroy Gardens, I broke the silence by asking the question that had rattled around my head for the last two hours. Just before I hurt my knee, did I shit myself? <laughs> to my eternal relief, Danny scoffed and said, no, mate, you were just unlucky. I'd never felt such a sense of relief in my life. Questions? I, I think the, gen the people, the Wheeler Centre people will find you. Our staff. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for employing such great staff. Um, my question is to you both, and that was really great to hear. Bob, you spoke about what would the game look like in 16 years, and you sort of said NFL style. And Martin, I saw you write about a few weeks ago about us sort of mirroring or taking lead from the GAA. Yeah. And I'm wondering what that might look like. Like how the AFL would do that. <clears throat> well, well, for me, like, for me, Australian football, in fact, I spent 1993, I wrote a book on the dogs and that was changed my view of the game. Before then, I took it for granted. And it was just after the dogs had nearly folded. And that was when I first saw the game as being culturally vulnerable. And I'm from Tasmania, and I know the trouble the game's in down there. And I know that clubs that have produced a string of AFL players cannot get sponsorships. 
um, that they are, the game is in recession down there. Um, and meantime, the top 11 executives at the AFL are paid six million bucks a year. They get paid on average more than the Prime Minister. Um, and, that, and, you know, they go each year over to the NFL and come back with four more American ideas to make the game into a form of entertainment. Whereas the thing, about, the thing I love about the Irish football, Irish football understands its place in Irish culture. The I Irish football would never have had meatloaf. Uh, I, <coughs> and I, I, just, I just think, you know, our game, it's the AFL and then it's at the grassroots. And I just think it's shameful that little clubs are struggling financially while we've got this bureaucracy in the game that's paid huge amounts of money. And, and another book right now that's very interesting on footy is Joffa's book. Joffa's just written a book and it's, it's well worth reading. Written for sure. Sorry? Well, I don't, I don't know that it is. Uh, it may be, but I don't know that. Uh, uh, I think the Wheeler Centre people are going to find... Thank you very much. Anybody who impresses Harry Taylor impresses me, so uh, <laughs> you are more interesting than you, know, you think you are. <laughs> um, I would like to hear your comments on what you think that last weekend's events say about our great and glorious game it's been a very emotional week, hasn't it? What do, what do those events and the way the, um, the players and everybody reacted to that, what does that say about our, our game and about our culture? Thank you. Um, I think, and it, they were, they were, it was, a, like you say, you know, a lot of emotion and um, some really powerful images and speaking to the, the players who, you know, when we stood arm in arm, it was, it was a real... It was really something very special and, and very difficult at the same time. Um, but I think it comes back to this um, this thing of where we come from, that, that footballers, you know, we've got the different jumpers on and different colours, but we, there's a brotherhood there of, of the game and the, and the footy clubs that we come from, that they're, they're still built on storytelling and they're still built on friendships and... And I think no matter how, that's why I have a, I'm not quite sure if I've made up my mind yet about, um, because the Americanisation of our game, it, it definitely is, it, it definitely is uh, creeping in. Um, but at the heart of it, the, the game that I see, the game that I spend my days at every day is still that, still built on the people, the stories, the humour, um, and the, and the, that, that that sense of belonging in that in that whether it's in that circle or in that club, um, I just the thing the thing that shits me about the the Americanisation is just that we I, I just get the sense that we assume or the the people who are that we just assume that that the American version is mm. is the better one and mm. that we just think oh kind of think they could learn a lot from. From how we do things, um, which I guess is a bit about what you're saying about the Irish, well, the Irish game. When Gillan McLaughlin first commented on it, he said it was a sad day for the footy industry, and and but when you were those interviews were coming out of Adelaide, people were talking about the footy family, two very different ideas about what the game is. And there was a point in the AFL's history I've never quite tracked it down, but where they started referring to people who go to the footy as consumers. They're not consumers. It's the, they, the AFL it has a delusion that it's a corporation. It's not a corporation. It did not create the asset. Yeah. They are merely... They are stewards for the game. And it's... Um, yeah, yeah, so last... <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, last weekend was a really powerful demonstration of how much footy is about tradition, belonging... And, and, and what it is that does to bring people together. I'd like to make a comment um, following that question. Um, I have a dear friend in Adelaide who is an absolute Crow supporter and she was devastated, as so many were. And she sent me a photo on Sunday afternoon. She'd been to communion at St Peter's Cathedral on Sunday morning at the cathedral end of the ground. And the dean 
of um, Adelaide, who is a South African, so AFL doesn't mean a lot in his heritage, had placed a crow's scarf and a port scarf on either side of the lectern on the pulpit at the front of St Peter's Cathedral. And it just symbolised that it doesn't matter who who or what people are, there's that sense of Adelaide belonging and, and, and then what happened that afternoon as well. Yeah. It was extraordinary, I thought. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm not used to these things. I want to congratulate both of you on your books, respectively. I've read them both, fabulous in their own special ways. On the uh, development of AFL as opposed to Aussie rules, as supporters and part of the wider family, do you have any advice for us as to how we can help rein some of this nonsense in? Because <laughs> emails, letters, conversations with the powers that be don't seem to uh, register at all. Is there anything we can do? Um, well, I, I, all I can say to you is don't stop and don't give up. And if you do stop writing letters and if you do stop trying to be heard on Talkback Radio, then you will surrender. It, it, it will go completely that way. I, I never realised... My big moment was the grand final. I can, I can never remember years, but the one when the Swans beat Hawthorne. Um, when was that, 2012? Yep. Um, that game, you know... <laughs> <laughs> that game, because, you know, the grand, AFL Grand Final is one of the great sporting icons. You know, it's one of the great sporting occasions. And some lunatic has decided to pump it up with noises that you hear in amusement arcades. Um, and, and that, that you know, I wrote in the paper, it's like um, Melbourne Museum deciding to modernise Far Lap by getting a graffiti artist in to spray a few tags on him, you know. It... it You've, you've got this great thing and then you've got these clowns who think they're going to enhance it by producing effects which are totally unoriginal um, and done around the world at sporting events. So that was when I sort of seriously began to worry. I liked what you said about the, the we're losing some of the silence and yeah. the, the silence is where some of the good stuff is. Yeah. I agree with that. I think that as, a, as a, someone who's not on the ground on grand final day yet... <laughs> Um, but that, um, in that when there's a when there's seventy thousand people and there's a silence, you know, in those yeah. in those big moments, that's that's what I don't know. That's what's special. Not not so much the t-shirt out of a cannon. No, yeah. no, don't give up. That's what I'm saying to that lady who asked that question. Do not give up. Just rage, rage against the dying of the light. Such a punk rocker still. <laughs> what? Such a punk rocker still. <laughs> Oh, hello. Look, uh, I just wanted... Pardon? Oh, look, my question was about the constant issue here about footballers being role models. I wanted to just ask you how you felt about it and also how that tied in with the, the illicit drug use, which, I mean, my impression is that the, that the press and the public generally are very sanctimonious about the whole thing, expecting... putting demands on young people which are just beyond what happens in the normal community. I mean, I've worked in workplaces where I found out I worked with a drug addict and I never even knew about it. I've worked in workplaces where there's somebody who was an alcoholic, but that was OK. And I just wonder how you guys see the, the whole debate. Um, yeah, I haven't heard uh, anything on the, the role model argument yet that I'm sort of keen to put my name to. It's, it doesn't sort of sit that right with, you know, that well with me. Um, the illicit drugs thing, for me, comes back, and we, and I kind of touched on it in there. Of, I worry about the well-being of my players in the, you know, in the, and I guess of players in general. I worry about their well-being. Um, I sometimes get the feeling that morality is is attached solely on on illicit drug use amongst AFL players and. And people sort of, you know, condemning and, and this sort of thing. But I, I worry about the well-being, whether it's um, whether it's anxiety of 
um, performance, whether it's gambling issues. I think it all they all probably come back to the the same the same problem or the same same issues that not just players but young men are young men are dealing with. So I, I'd I'd probably like the focus to go a bit more on that. Um, to be honest, than my frustration with the 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 illicit drugs policy. You know, I was on the AFL players board when we when we brought in the policy as a um, it was very what was the word I'm looking for not ambitious but it was it was kind of attempting to try something to to help help the well-being of of players and it was really um, hijacked by um, by people who didn't understand it really and continue to not understand it that if there's 1,500 tests done or, you know, 2,000 tests done, the headline is five, five positives or, you know, whatever, whatever the, you know, it's an arbitrary figure. Um, I think it distracts us from the, just the well-being of, of young men. I've got strong feelings about this because I think there's... <clears throat> the, in, like, I've been a footy journalist or a footy writer for, for 30 years and, and, and the growth in what I would call predatory journalism has just been enormous during that time. And to take an example of something I'm interested in, like Aboriginal issues, Michael Long changed the game. I, I, I used to go to footy matches here in Melbourne before he did and I remember what the racism was like off the field and on the field. It's nothing like that now. But now, if there is one incident of it, it's a massive issue in the media. Yeah. And because that's a massive issue in the media, the media never had... The, the, or the, not the whole of the media, but, but a lot of the media, then never have to ask themselves questions about closing remote Aboriginal communities because they're being so morally virtuous on this one small thing. And, it's, and, that's, and so I feel there's, there's, there's an element of dishonesty for me in the way, and, and this whole thing about some 19 year old kid has taken cocaine, or you know, this massive focus comes in on this 19 year old kid. Um, but again, I, I think it becomes a way that we as a society don't actually have to look at the real problems. I, 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 yeah, I feel, I feel very sorry for footballers. They're, they're becoming athletic monks. <laughs> <laughs> and you're you're a friar, Bobby. Yes, <laughs> yep. Thanks, Bob and Martin, for sharing your time this evening with us. Bob, uh, having been 16 years with the Bulldogs, you've had a number of leaders. Now you are leading that club. What are your comments about what it takes to be a leader of an AFL club? And Martin, you were alluding to the fact that. The AFL is an industry, and what could collective captains, how could they influence the future of the AFL? It's a good question. Um, I th I'm really um, kind of relieved that, that I've become a captain after 15 years. I think that, would, that might stress a few out, but, um, but I, I've enjoyed it because I've played under so many captains, and you know, I've kind of looked at my whole footy career as uh, in a, a bit like a magpie where you're a bulldog magpie. A magpie of, you, you know, taking bits from, from, from people everywhere. Um, captains, coaches, teammates, Martin, Bruce Springsteen, whoever it is. And I, so I say that, I don't, I'm not really, I'm not joking about it. Like, you, you know, you, you pick a little bits from, from everywhere and ultimately you, can, you end up only being yourself. But... Um, yeah, I can. I, I'm really influenced by the by the by the people who are close to me, um, and in a captain sense, and, and just in situations, you, I just sort of draw on. Oh, I wonder what they would do. I wonder what. Um, it's not not a bad theory. To what would Chris Grant do here? That's always a pretty safe one to to go back to, um, and it, a lot of it just comes back to just having a go. Just sometimes you get it wrong. Sometimes you get it right, but. Um, I try and try and empathise with the situation and the player, and and then the other one is when the shit hits the fan, be up the front. Um, that's that's sort of how I try and keep it as simple as that. I suppose my answer to your question is um, I've met a lot of great people through footy, men and women, and I've met some 
wonderful women through footy. Um, and some of the players I've met have been terrific people. And, um, um, you know, I'm not going to embarrass Rob by talking about him, but um, someone like Tom Harley, the Geelong captain, what a, he was a really interesting man. He went and became a house husband after he'd, after he'd um, and a father, um, you know, for a while there after he after he'd captained Geelong to what two premierships. Um, Nathan Buckley, I mean, we were talking about Phil Walsh's de death. Nathan Buckley put out a tweet that was just just a really succinct, um, genuine, modest statement of compassion. Um, he's a really interesting man, Nathan Buckley. Um, and I, I just think there are, you know, if there, there are there are always going to be rogues and villains, but I, to me that's important too because one of the things I always loved about footy was that the door was always open to everyone. And I think once, you, once we close the door to people, then the game loses part of what makes it important. But I have met some terrific people through footy and, um, and, I, and, and I think they, they do influence other people in good ways. <coughs> Yeah, that's it. Going, going, gone. No, there's a the gentleman with his hand up here. Ooh, okay. Um, I was just going to ask, what do you think we can do to promote um, women's football and also do you think women will ever be properly included in football? Well, I think um, women's football is a terrific, is, is a terrific force in this culture. Um, I find it fascinating that... Um, you know, we have a certain problem with getting young boys to play the game um, because their parents and their mothers think the game's too violent and at the same time, young girls, are bo the game is booming amongst young girls. I think that's just something really interesting in our culture. Um, you know, one of my footy heroes is, um, who unfortunately died last year, was a woman called Ruth Brain who kept alive the Moist and Malora Football Club, one of the most historic football clubs in Australia. Um, she, she kept it alive in her district um, just a magnificent woman. Um, you know, that's one of the things I love about footy is, um, is the fact that a Dutch journalist came here about 20 years ago and he said to me that he'd, he'd, he'd observed Australian football and he only had two questions to ask. One was the number of registered AFL players in Australia was the same as the number of registered soccer players in Holland. He said the difference here is everyone talks about it. Why? And I said, I thought that had to do with the fact that there were so much American shows on television that a character like Barry Hall that we all went to school with, if, if we don't see him through football, we don't see him. And Michael Long. Um, but the other question he had was, I think the figure he gave me for women at, um, at, at Premier League soccer matches in Europe was 13%. In Australian football, it's 46 or 48%. Um, women are a really important part of this game and when you read the history of the game it, they always have been and it seems to me that because it started as a game that was played in parks uh, as free entertainment in parks there was no members area there was no ladies area um, and anyone came who wanted to come and everyone stood where they wanted to stand and I think that's where the egalitarian nature of the game came but I think um, AFL women's footy is on the march um, the number of teams is increasing. Uh, there are two games this year, two AFL women's games. The dogs are going Yeah, the team. dogs are uh, heavily involved and the girls came and trained with us a few weeks ago and even in the... I think we've been involved with it for three or four years. That you can you feel the momentum yeah. every time, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, like you say, it's surging and the media are behind it. The girls are incredible. Yeah. Uh, the skill and they play. They, it's great footy to watch. Yeah, that get the game they play. Every, like it's you can feel the buzz yeah. around the place that it's it's um it's growing and yeah could go anywhere. Yeah, fingers crossed it does. Yep. Um, I'd like to ask um, Bob if he could tell the audience um, the role that the sports science directors or personnel are playing in the game. Is it significant? Uh, is it going to get even more significant? Um, I get stuck into we've got a, our our sports science um, guys at the footy club. They've got a little office, and I like to pop my head in there and wind them up daily. <laughs> after they hate being called phys editors after <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Most days, I just sort of pop my head in to say, 
you blokes tried to ruin the game three years ago and we're slowly getting it back off you. But, so they don't take that too well. But um, <laughs> oh, it, it's got its place. It's not the sort of dark arts. It's, um, there's a lot of good people and we've, we've, we're lucky to have a good bunch. And um, I, I am intrigued, though, as to, um, with the, the science of the game that um, you know, we're striving for these fractions of a you know fraction of a percent for um, altitude training and all this sort of thing and testing levels of testosterone whatever it is just all this sort of you know fiddling around and and then you you know the guys aren't eating properly or they're not sleeping properly or you know we could get fifteen percent here or and we could have you know there's there's ro- there's so much room for improvement of. Um, guy, getting guys the mental side of the game right that I think sometimes the, the science side is, is a bit overrated but it definitely plays a part um, it's helping, yeah, it, yep it's helping, I can I, I, I get the benefit but there's it's, 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 a small, it's a small part of the pie Well, I'm afraid to say I think we've one well, more up the back oh. Yeah, thank you, Martin, and thank you, Bob. And uh, I think it's a testament to both of you that you have the room filled with such joie de vivre and energy. I've never seen the room so charged up with emotion and, and passion. So thank you, both of you. Uh, my question is to Bob. Uh, brief statement first. You played fantastic against my team, Richmond, and you kind of cost my team with scoring a goal, but I still respect you for that. Um, <laughs> but the question is, Bob, your favourite Bruce Springsteen album... And James Joyce or Samuel Beckett? Is that for me or for Martin? You, you oh. take the second one. <laughs> uh, depends what day it is for Springsteen. If I'm having a good day, I'd definitely be born to run. But if I'm having a, if I'm having a bit of a shitty day, there'll be darkness on the edge of town. I'm having a good day today. I'm having a good day today. Uh, but Joyce and Beckett are of great interest to me. Um, the book I take on every holiday is Finnegan's Wake because you can never get to the end of it. Uh, I've never got to the start of it. I just, I just flick it open like the Bible and read a page, but I do love it. And I think we have to go. They're even opening the doors at the back. We were told to get off at 7.15. So thank you all very much for coming. Yeah.